have your Bibles, would you turn to the Gospel of Matthew, the 25th chapter. We're going to look at verses 19 to 30. Matthew chapter 25, verses 19 to 30. And when you have it, would you signify by standing to your feet? Amen. Matthew 25, verses 19 to 30. If you don't do not have it, uh, you can follow on the screen again. If you when you have it, would you signify by standing to your feet? Amen. Reading from the New Living Translation, the Word of God reads as follows: After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the ten baths of silver. To those who, <coughs> who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But for those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Thus far the word of God, you may be seated. The title of our sermon this morning is Satisfying a Steward's Debt of Love. Part six, satisfying a steward's debt of love. Part six. Last week we tackled the beginning of this parable. Amen. This is known as the parable of the tenants. Amen. Uh, of the talents. I'm sorry. The parable of the talents. Some of your Bibles will say the parable of the three servants. But we know this uh, scripture because it's been preached ad nauseum when it's time to give your tithes and offering. It's time to contribute to the church. And one of the things we said last week at that that this scripture is not a scripture that should be used or is appropriately used to get you to pay your tithes and your offering. Malachi 3 10 is a scripture that we use uh, to show you the biblical importance of paying your tithes and offering. This scripture speaks about stewarding uh, the property of God, the things of God, the kingdom of God. And what we see in this parable is that the master, God in the form of the master, calls his servants together to, to manage, to oversee, to invest, and be responsible for a certain amount of his property. Amen. And we talked about, so just give you a quick update to get you where we are right now. We talked about how uh, in uh, 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 giving each servant uh, property to invest, we talked about how God did not give each servant the same amount. Amen. That uh, God understands that we're different. That I, as good as I look, I uh, am not uh, Brother Pettis, I am not Brother Rembert, I am not Brother Jones. We are four different men, and because we are four different men, we have different lights, we have different skills, we have different abilities. 
Amen. I was so shocked this week when I got to the church and I was, was I was seeing uh, Deacon Rembrandt working on the portache. Amen. He was out there with his uh, uh, his nail gun, with his saw, and he was working with the rest of the men. I did not know that brother had that kind of skill. I have to give it up to you, Doc. Amen. I usually give him a hard time about that. Now, I did tell the head foreman to watch him with that nail gun because I was not prepared to have to go and tell Deacon this member how her husband got hurt at church. In fact, I told them they could just give him one of the little Tonka toy imitation hammers that he could just hammer with that one. Uh, so that way, at least when he went home, uh, there would not be any explanation. But Brother Rember showed us this week that God has gifted him uh, uniquely. And as wonderful as those gifts are, those gifts may not be the same gifts for the other men here at church. And if it's not, that's fine. But the truth is, God gave us some kind of gift. And he expects us to use that gift to steward his kingdom, to steward the, uh, the spreading of the word, to steward mission, to steward witnesses, to steward testifying, to steward the discipling of other people. God has entrusted all of us to do it, and he has given it to us in different amounts. So guess what that means? That means you don't have to get upset with me or God if you don't like the amount of steward and responsibility God has given me in comparison to you. In fact, we talked about how uh, 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 we shouldn't because we don't know what all God has put on someone's shoulder. And here's the thing, what you're seeing is just a moment's notice, a moment's glimpse, a moment's uh, glory in, in, in the things of God that you're looking at and then you're upset because in that moment it looks like God has given someone else something bigger, more important to you. But here's the thing, if your job is to be the heart and the body of Christ, you've got a very serious job to do. Your job is to pump the blood, the nutrients throughout the body. And while we may not see you pumping blood throughout, then we'll know if you ain't working it when the body dies. And so we can't be upset when God has uh, assigned to us our different stewardship assignments. We also talked about how a stewardship is a calling. And that every one of us is called to stewardship. And we also wrestle with this whole thing that if we're already God's servants, why does he have to call us? Because what God is doing that once we get to a point where we can function, Confidently. Once we get to a point where we can do uh, the little things, the basic things, God is ready then to assign responsibility, more responsibility to us, and he's assigning kingdom responsibility. This is why you cannot take it uh, for granted uh, when you walk out these doors and you're living your life. This is why when you run to someone and they do something, you want to give them the finger, not the first finger, not the third finger, not the fourth finger, not the thumb. You know the finger I'm talking about. You want to give them the finger. You can't give them the finger because remember, you have been assigned kingdom responsibility. You've been assigned godly stewardship, and, this, and the kingdom is in your hands. So everything we have to do has to be done in a way that brings glory to God. And then we talked about the uh, investing that the stewards invested, and what we talked about was that all of the, that two of them. Went to invest. We're not told what brokers' house they went to invest in. We're not told what stocks they invested in. We're not told what 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 if they diversified their portfolio or they go you know, with straight stocks. We're not told how they did it. What we're told is that they invested. Uh, two of the servants invested the property that their master gave them, and they produced uh, a result. And that's where we're picking up this morning. And where we picked up this morning uh, is that the master has returned home. In fact, we ended last week with the whole statement that the master left. That Jesus is saying that I'm going to leave. I'm going to go away. We can assume he's gone to heaven. We can assume he's right there sitting beside the throne making intercession before us. But the point is the master, he, God, is going to leave for a while. And he's left responsibility for the kingdom in our hands. And he's expecting us to fulfill our responsibility. But here's the thing we're told in verse 19. One day the master returned. In fact, we can... <coughs> excuse me almost put that in our pocket to know that eventually the day is coming when God is coming back. 
He's going to return here to earth. And he's going to want to see what we have done. Now, you know what I found, at least in my life, in the lives of those that are around, is that because we don't quite know when God is coming back, sometimes we assume he's not coming back. I mean, you can tell the truth and shame the devil because the thought is, if he was coming back, he would have said, you know, I'm coming back on Thursday. Cause that's how we do. You know, I'm going out of town. I will not be back until Thursday. You cannot contact me to Friday. But God doesn't give us a, a return date. And what happens, because he doesn't give us a return date, eventually we get comfortable in thinking that we can do and fulfill our stewardship assignments whenever we want to. We got time. We got time. And God wants me to go ahead and build this. I, I, I got it. I got it. I got it. And you know what we do? We allow everyone else and everything else to start taking priority in our lives. You know, I'm a, I'm a member of a Menocide 5. We're going to go over here. We're going to do this. So I'm going to go serve with my frat brothers. I'm a member of Delta Sigma Theta or Alpha Kappa Alpha a sorority or, or, or Kentucky Fried Chicken Fraternity. I'm sorry, Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity. Amen. I ain't really brother Penny. You don't woke up on that one. Look, you talking about, don't you talk about my fraternity. Amen. Uh, I, I, I'm in my organization, we're going to do this. I'm a link, I'm part of Jack and Jill, I'm the Eastern Star, I'm a Mason, I'm part of that. You know, I belong to this community improvement group and I'm part of that. We get involved with all these other things and we neglect the stewardship assignment that God has given us. And then what happens when God shows up, we want to look surprised, we want to look like he called us, like, like, like we didn't know that we even had an assignment. And here's the thing I say to you right now, I'm not even in my life, but I'm just dealing with this right now because I think someone is thinking that they have more time than they have. You are on a countdown. You are in a time, a definite time period. And you need to get started doing whatever God has called you to do. So guess what? If you're 80 years old, and guess what? At 80 years old is when you start doing it. I'm sorry you didn't do it when you were 20, when you were 30, when you were 40, when you were 50, when you were 60, when you were 70. You're 80 now. And so that means you may have to work a little harder because guess what? You don't have everything at 80 that you used to have at 20. But you got to get it done. Because guess what? We're going to see later on that if we don't get it done, God calls us evil, wicked, and lazy. And guess what? If there's any designation that you don't want, it's God's designation to be called evil, wicked, and lazy. And so he returns. And uh, he calls his service to them and, and requires them to give accounting. In fact, give me my first point, because that's the first point of our sermon here today. Uh, just as we're called to stewardship, we're also called to give an accounting of our stewardship. We're called to be accountable. That when God calls us to something, whatever it is that you're calling us, you know, I ask you many times, what's your calling? I'm asking you, what it is God has called you to do? What I'm asking you is, what is your disciple, your 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 stewardship assignment? And, 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 and many times we have no problem saying, you know, Pastor, I'm called to help. I'm called to a minister. I'm called to teach. I'm called to preach. I'm called to do this. I'm called to do that. But you do know you're called to account for it. You're called to be accountable. Which means you're called to, uh, you're required to give an accounting of each and everything you did with that which God has given you. In fact, let me hit you with this. How many people know how many hours in a week? Okay. Well, how many hours in a week do you? 168. 168 hours. If you had to give an accounting to God for how you spent the last seven days, how many of us can say we spent those seven days uh, 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 working on our stewardship assignments? Oh, my pastor's in trouble. Hey, amen. I ain't doing a good job. Amen. And I know what happens. You get busy. You don't have time. Because you got to get here. You don't have time because you have to do this. People have a job on some hours. They want 40 of those 168 hours. I mean, so you got 128 hours left over. Well, Pastor, I got to get some rest. I got to get at least seven hours of rest. And seven times seven is 49. So we take away uh, uh, 49 from 128 leaves us uh, 87 hours. So you got 87 hours left. You got half a week left uh, to do to do something with. But what did you do with it? 
know, Pastor, I had to go exercise for at least an hour every other day. And then I had this meeting here, Pastor. And here, thank God, starts looking at the time. And what we find is our stewardship, the time we dedicate to stewardship is probably the time we came to church on Sunday morning. And out of 168 hours, we gave God an hour and a half. And then we sit there looking, and when God's looking at us, look, looking, and, and looking at Him, we're like, "Well, God, I thought I gave you more than that. That's 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 for that's for that. that's uh, ten hours a week, ten hours a month. I gave you ten hours a month, God. Aren't you happy? No, because what if I gave you only ten hours of breath in thirty days? Gave you ten hours of favor in thirty days?" Gave you 10 hours of anointing in 30 days. In fact, I only let you eat for 10 hours this month. Now I know some of us be like, oh, praise God, we can lose weight. If we, we don't only eat for 10 hours. But come on, be, let's be for real. Them hunger pains hit you. And you have you want to go eat, but God's only allowed you 10 hours to eat. What if God treated us like we treat him? And may, he made us the last things on his mind. Some of us will be in trouble right now. Come on, tell the truth, shame the devil. Because some of us have only gotten where we are because of, of God being on our side. And think about if God didn't do all he did for us when he did it for us. We would be in trouble. We are called to be accountable. We are called to take advantage of every opportunity, every every invitation, every moment to serve Him. And here's the thing: God is not going to hear your excuses. God, you know you must with three kids. I got a wife. I don't care. I gave you that because I knew you could handle that and your stewardship responsibility. In fact, what if God treats you like your job is? Guess what? God don't care what's going on in your personal life. You come in late enough time, the job will fire you. If you don't work and perform, the job will demote you. You know, they, what if God treats us like that? We've got to be accountable and account for our stewardship. The, the, those three guys, those three servants, those three girls came and they gave an accounting of their stewardship efforts that one had five baths and then, and then multiply the five baths with another five baths has ten baths one had two multiply the two now has four and then one had one it didn't do anything so they have just one but they all are accountable and you have to give an accounting before God amen give me my second point doc amen just it's not just that we're called to stewardship we're called to be accountable but when it comes to stewardship, the Lord is focused on results rather than methods. You know, as kids, uh, we used to think it was a big deal when our parents asked us to be accountable for, to account for something. We would give them the story of how we did it. You know, Dad and Mom, we, we got up and we went and we had to get trash bags and you know, the leaves, they were all in the yard. I mean, there were leaves from the front of the yard to the back of the yard. I mean, you could barely see any grass. And, you know, Dad, it took a long time for us. Yeah, you've been gone two hours, but we've been raking the whole two hours. The two men were out there playing, jumping in the leaves and whatnot. But we, we've been raking the whole, and ooh, we so tired. Ooh, we just gonna go to bed early tonight, Dad. You know, we, we, we get in, and, 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 and my parents were looking at us and said, if you've been raking for two hours, why are there so many leaves? Still in the yard. If you've been putting the effort in, why do I see leaves in the yard? Because guess what? My parents were not concerned with how we went about raking. My parents were concerned that the leaves were raked out of the yard. But guess what? So is God. In this scripture, notice God never asked the, the, these stewards, these servants, how did they invest their money? Who did you invest in? Where was your investment? Then it asked the methodology. Did you pull it from here? Did you wait until you had a full run? Or did you wait until this? He doesn't care how. If In fact, he's more concerned about the results. He wants to know, did you earn something when, when you invested? And what we see is confirmed. Because he says to them, good job. Good job, my good and faithful servant. You who have been responsible over a little. 
And you know, the time we know we read the fall the King James, because that's the one we learned. Amen. But in the same scripture, he said, you who are uh, responsible over a small amount, now let me give you more responsibility. King James, let me give you more. God wants to see how you handle small amounts. In fact, so let me help you out, okay? The reason why you have only been able to win that 5 and $10 lottery slip that you've been playing, amen, come on, tell the truth, and the devil. I know we've been waiting for the big one, but in the interim, so now we go and we get the $5, $10 scratch-offs to see if we can at least learn $10 and $5. And the reason why you keep hitting on that one with no problem, but you can't hit the big one, is because God says, I don't know how responsible you're going to be with the big one. I don't mind letting you hit 5 and $10. Because guess what? You can't do any damage with five or ten dollars. But imagine if God had given you the two hundred and forty-nine million that was there on Tuesday. Some of us be dead right now. Would have strangled on money. And God says, "I want to give you a little bit first." See how you handle. The reason why you don't come into the job and you are automatically the CEO of the company is because they want to give you a little bit of responsibility. See how you handle it. The reason why you just can't walk up into an architect's office and build me. You know, I want something different. I want seven bedrooms, 14 bathrooms. I want two dressing rooms. And when that my guy, you start off with a condo, I want to see how you handle it. And the more we show God we cannot handle the small things, the more God says, I'm not ready to give you the big things. And here's a beautiful thing. God doesn't care how you handle it. Just handle it. I'm always amazed when I see people uh, receive these from God and they treat it like it's just any old kind of thing. I remember I had a friend, uh, I don't know if I told you all this, I mean I told you this before, uh, he inherited his dad's church. Dad built that church from nothing. And the one thing he dad was never able to do was raise enough money to pay their parking lot. So what they would do when they came to church, they brought two pairs of shoes. Like for today, they had two pairs of shoes. They have a pair of shoes that they wear and walk through the mud in to get to the church. And to be in the front of their church, they had like a landing uh, spot. And they in a bench, they would sit down, and take off those muddy shoes, leave them under the bench, put on their good shoes, come through the sanctuary doors for church. When it was time to leave, go back out, take off the good shoes, put on the muddy shoes, and walk back through the parking lot to get to their cars. And here's the thing, because of county ordinance, they were required to have some lights put in the in their in their parking lot uh, by Duke Energy. Well, Duke Energy said, "Well, if you give us an easement, we'll give you a parking lot." Something his dad had never been able to do, but they got a paved parking lot front and back. So when they pay, I said, so "What's your celebration? What are your dedication to your parking lot?" He said, "We're not having one." I said, "God has blessed you." to give you a brand new parking lot that you did not have to pay for. And I said, I said, you know, I said, if you're not going to thank God, don't expect him to do anything else. Because here's the thing, he gave you the parking lot. As, as awesome that was, God probably has more for you. And you're going to have to thank him. That's why I said we got to be thankful for this colonnade out here, this portico out here, this portico out here. Because the truth is, do, do you remember, amen, let me give, give, give me our heads up for 2020. We really need one on the back side, too, because we have persons who park in the handicapped spot. So what happens, everyone that can walk gets a free cover, but everyone that has a problem walking has to walk through the rain. And so here's the thing, we, that, that costs money out there. But, but before God is going to give us not a nary red pity to build another one, he wants to see how we praise him for that one. Here it is, we, 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 we sitting here, we're so used to having laptops and computers. When I say we got computers, I always look to me like, oh, computers, okay. In fact, there, you know, there's some churches that would die for that. Because that's a tool that they know that they can use to spread the word. Every little thing God has done here, we have to celebrate it and we have to be good stewards over it. That's why we, are, we pushed as hard as we did on that beam. We could have took it, taken the first uh, 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 estimate we got, it would have been highway robbery. But we trusted and we believed that if we, if, we, if we stuck to God, God would connect us with someone who would enable us to do that theme and so much more, and he did. And 
So, so guess what God is going to do now? He says, okay, since you show me that you can handle that kind of responsibility, I'm going to give you some more responsibility. Because again, I don't care how you handle it. The fact is, I care that you get it done. And so for someone, let me give you a hint, for someone that's waiting for God to turn around and bless you at, uh, in your life tremendously, I tell you to go back and start maximizing what he's giving you. If you're looking to have the kind of marriage that mama and daddy and grandmama and granddaddy had when they were married for 125 years, then guess what? You've got to be stop being so picky over the little things your spouse is doing and learn to build your spouse up. you got to stop being so critical of him or her and be more supportive of him or her. you got to see their dreams and even when they can't see their dreams come to pass and come to reality come to pass you've got to be walk up to them and say uh uh you're not quitting now you're not sitting down now you're going to get your hind parts up and you're going to do it because guess what God has more in store for us I am not trying to be in the same place next year that we are right now I'm trying to see us go there but to go there, we all got to uh, be, be responsible for that which God has given us. So that means when you are teaching Sunday school or you are teaching your classes, you got to teach that class as if God has assigned you 2,500 million people to teach. And their lives depend on it when you sing. you got to sing like your life depends on it. Because God wants to see how we handle stuff. But the devil is like, he ain't choking me up today. This word's coming out. <clears throat> Amen. God is not focused on your methods. He's focused on your results. And many of us, though, are upset that God has resulted us the way we thought he should. Well, guess what? You've got to get busy. Amen. Come on, give him a third point. I think I'm here. Appreciate it. Amen. Amen. Oh, no, I have it. Amen. Investing in God's kingdom always creates return. Investing in in the things of God always creates a return. Notice in the scripture that the, the, the servants that are called a steward, the first two, they take the money and they invest it. Now here's the thing. Their investing is like our investing. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We're not sure if, what, uh, if what's good today will be good tomorrow. And really when you invest in anything, you're taking a risk. What you really should be doing is doing your research into the investment potential, seeing what the chances for growth are, and you try to pick a growth rate uh, uh, that is good for you, all right? So these guys, or these gals who have these bags of money have gone out and they have, find invest they have found investment opportunities, and they are investing their money in the investment opportunity, but they don't know how well this is going to turn out. It's only over the passage of time, this is why God stays away as long as he does, because guess what? Investments are like planting crop. You plant a seed, and if you don't get any harvest the next day, you plant the seed, the, the seed sprout, the sprout comes out of the ground, it's a tree ling, a sapling, a little bush, you water the bush, you nurture the bush, the bush grows, and then produces crop for you to harvest. But that's the same thing with investment. Just because you invest today, you're not going to get anything out of it tomorrow. In fact, if you were to invest $100 right now in Wells Fargo, then you're, if you wanted a dividend on Monday evening, you only get about $1.18. What you have to do is let that stock stay there in Wells Fargo for a while so that your, your dividends start accumulating exponentially. And the longer you leave it in there, the more money you earn out of that. Same thing with these guys. So they were doing it. But the one thing they were not certain of is would they be successful? Because the word is, because the third servant says it, we know you are a harsh man. You reap where you do not sow. You cultivate where you did not plant. So they all know who they are dealing with. Their master is a hard man. But what we see is that those who actually made the effort to invest had a return. The one, the one that had five, when he invested the five, guess what? He got five more back. The one that had two, when he, when he invested or she invested, she got two back. That's a hundred percent return, y'all. Do y'all know in this world right now, way we live, there's only two things that you can have 100% return on. If you invest, I'm not talking about your love and your relationships, but if you invest your money, your house and your church. 
Because guess what? Every penny you pay to your house, that you pay toward paying that mortgage down, whatever that percentage is, 100% of that percentage comes back to you. So even if you're paying, even if your payment, each payment you're getting 1% of your house, you're getting the full 1% back of ownership out of every time you make that payment. Same thing with your tithes. Everything that you give to church, you'll get back 100%. Everything. If I'm surprised churches aren't more uh, uh, tax shelters than they are. Because everything you give, you get back. Those are the only two investments in America right now that give you 100% return. In fact, if you were to get 7 or 8% return on any of your investment, you've done well. The SEC and the IRS has launched investigations on companies who have multiple quarters of 7 and 8% return because that's unheard of. And here it is, God is saying that whenever we invest in the kingdom, whenever we speak something into someone's life, whenever we help someone, whenever we mentor someone, whenever we teach someone, whenever we minister to someone, whenever we have outreach towards someone, that whatever we do will create a return and a 100% return. Everything we do, which means whatever God has called you to do, and I know some of you may be saying, well, God hasn't called me to do something in the church. He's called me to do something in the world. So guess what? He's called you to write the book. And you've been messing around because you've seen everyone else's book, and you're trying to say, what do I have to add to the discussion because everyone else has a book out there? You have whatever God told you to write. That's the add to the discussion. You need to get out there and start writing because if you at least try, you will get a return on it. If God has called you to start a school for uh, underprivileged kids, yes, there's a charter school here, an elementary school there, a private school here. What can you add? You can add whatever God has called you to add. If you will get busy, there will be a return. The word says you have not because you ask not. The door is not open because you never knock. You never Fine, because you never seek. See that see 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 how it's all coming together? That God has put the obligation of us to try. This is why I get so mad with folks when they won't even try. They want God to do the impossible, God to do the amazing. But when you say, well, God, you got to do this part, they won't even try. And then they get upset because they say, God, could you didn't put anything in there? Not to get the word says it. It's right here. The third servant. He did nothing with his with his bag money. Didn't put it in the bank, didn't invest it, did nothing. So guess what he got? Nothing. If you're gonna do nothing, expect nothing. God ain't gonna give you something for nothing. Let's get that out of your head. I know some of these prosperity preachers have come and told you that if you just believe God will shower you with all this, no, you got to do some work. You got to put some effort in. And then once you put the effort in, God will meet the effort that you give. So guess what? If you put 25% effort in, expect him to give you 25% and expect a 50% return. But if you give him 100%, expect a 200% return. But you got to do something. And I want you to know if you would do something. Because he said, he told the guy, he said, if you had just put my money in the bank, at least you would have interest. Which, again, goes back to the result. He wasn't looking for a certain amount. He just wanted to see something be returned to him. Amen. Amen. Our last uh, point, and we're going to go home. This is where I promised you last week. Amen. God considers Christians that fail to fulfill their stewardship requirements wicked, evil, and lazy. I said this last week, and people looked at me like I was crazy. Because you don't ever, no one ever wants a thing that the God that we serve, the God that loves us, the God that sits high and lets go, the God that's the will in the middle of the will, the God that's the lily in the valley, the God that is the sword and the shield, the God of grandmama, granddaddy, and auntie, the God that has brought us one with the God of our weary years, the God of our silent tears, the God who has done so many wonderful things. None of us want to ever think that that God will judge us in a way that's less than loving. And in fact, many of us have tried to do all these wonderful things so that we can balance out our account sheet, our account ledger. 
You know, we may not actually engage in that what we're called to do, but guess what? We always invite our, our children's friend over that really doesn't come from a dis, uh, disadvantaged house to eat dinner with us. When we go on trips, we take them with us. You know that when we're out at the grocery store, we walk the little old lady to a car, and we put in fact, if, if she got a car, we put the, the groceries in, the, in her trunk. If we don't, if she doesn't have a car, she get on the bus, we help her get on the bus and put the bags on the bus, and we pay her dollar and twenty five sense and send her on the way, you know, when uh, Miss such and such uh, uh, across the street, the little old woman that can't take her trash cans out, we go and we put them on the side. So we do all this wonderful stuff thinking that the more we do, that's going to balance out what we don't do. Let me help you out today. If you do not engage in your stewardship assignments, all that's for not. I'm sure that each one of those three servants were good servants. I'm sure that they had spent many years offering faithful service to God. But one incident, one assignment, separates two of them from a third one. And here it was, God called, the master called them to steward his property. And failure to steward his property had the third servant, Tad, as an evil, wicked, lazy servant. All that wiped down the drain. And I know someone may be saying that the devil is a liar. I go, well, how about this? How about we have a little running bet here? Well, don't worry, we'll probably be a judgment day together. That's what the word said. We're all going to be called. And we're on our account. And while we have a running bet, I'm going to do my stewardship assignment. You don't do yours. Let's see which one gets in heaven. Amen. I'm not going to be the one not to do it. Amen. I'm, gonna, I'm trying to get in heaven. But since I know there's someone who doesn't believe me right now, it's in the word. God, in fact, God is saying in the word, not only are you a wicked, evil, and lazy servant, but you're useless. What does he say about salt? Salt that has losing, lost its ability to flavor is only worth being thrown on the fire. You're useless. You have no value. You have no purpose. And guess what God says? Throw him out into the darkness where there's gnashing of teeth and weeping. Y'all, 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 that, that's hell. That something is simple. I don't know what it is God has called you to do, but whatever it is God has called that's enough to keep you out of heaven if you're not going to do it. That's why I said earlier, if you waited 80 years, I'm sorry, you waited 80 years, but now is the time to get started. Yeah, you may not have the strength that you had. That means you're going to call on someone else to help you, but you got to get it done. Because guess what? God has called us a stewardship, and let me help someone else as I bring this sermon to a close. From the <laughs> From the beginning, it's been about stewardship. From the beginning, it's been about stewardship. That when God called Israel into relationship with him, he called them to be a royal priesthood and a peculiar nation. To be a royal priesthood means that you are going before others, showing them how to live, showing them how to work, showing them how to function so that they may be able to be the people you're called to be. God had called Israel to model for the rest of the world stewardship, to model discipleship, to model faith, to model service, to model love, to model praise, to model worship. God had called Israel to model all that. But you know what Israel did? Israel thought that the stewardship requirement was not on them. Israel thought they could do whatever they wanted to do and everything would be fine. So God sent judges to Israel to lead them. But guess what? They did not listen to the judge. They did not follow. In fact, what they did, they started worshiping the judges that God sent to get them back on page. They worshiped Worship their Canaanite neighbors. They worship the gods of their Canaanite neighbors. They did everything but what they were supposed to. So once God had finished sending judges, God then sought, sent prophets. And these prophets came to declare the word of God. Thus says the Lord. Hear what the Lord has to say. Hear what the Lord requires. God called them to stewardship. 
to serve him in a way that bring, brought glory to him as well as growing his kingdom on earth. But you know what they did to the prophets? They stoned their prophets. They beat their prophets. They killed their prophets. They mistreated the prophets. They did not treat the prophets of men and women of God with honor, but yet they rejected what the prophets had to say. So God said, I'm going to try this one more time. I'm going to send someone that can understand exactly the human condition, the human plight. So he sent his son Jesus down to earth to live our life. And Jesus' purpose of being here was to teach us how to, 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 to steward the kingdom of God. Yes, he performed miracles. Yes, he healed. Yes, he saved. Yes, he restored. Yes, he resurrected. Yes, he did all these wonderful things. But they were all done with the eye toward teaching people not only what the kingdom of God is about, but teaching them how to steward the kingdom of God. How to take what he has taught them and do more. That's why Jesus said to the disciples when they wanted to send the people home, you feed them. And when they couldn't figure out, he said, give me the food. He blessed the food. He prayed over the food. And he gave it back to them in small pieces. And they were able to feed people on two different times. That's why Mary came to Jesus and said, I know it's not your time. I know it's not your day. But at this wedding festival, they run out of wine. And so Jesus told them, what do you have? They said, all we have is the water that's in the jars. Now the water in the jars was water that was designed to clean feet. And the water was dirty. The water was nasty. The water was filthy. But being who God is, God changed what was dirty, nasty, filthy, filthy sinful, and turned it into wine. <coughs> that was a better taste of wine than the one that the, uh, the host of the wedding festival had. That God constantly through Jesus was teaching us how to engage in stewardship. In fact, Jesus says, greater things than these shall you do. And so God has already told us that if we would just engage in stewardship, then multiplying what he's given us is not a hard thing. In fact, that's to be, a, be expected. In fact, he says we will do greater than this. But guess what? Those who should have recognized God God's call, the recalling to stewardship, those who should have recognized God's hand on Jesus' life, all they could see was that Jesus' efforts at stewardship were, were successful. All they could see was that he was converting more people than they were, that he was drawing more people than they were, that he was bringing more people to God than they were, and they got jealous, and they got upset, and they, uh, they thought the only way they could stop Jesus from beating them at doing that which God had called them to do was to take them out. So they charged him with Jesus. And they had him arrested. They had him convicted. They spent all night beating him. They spent all night uh, bruising him. They spent all night lacerating his body. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They took off a, 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 a sheet that was underneath the, the saddle of a, of, a, of a horse and they put a wrapped around him and they paraded him around, mocking him, calling him a king, calling him the king of the Jews. He went through this all night and the truth is, is that when the uh, uh, head Roman uh, centurion came, he said, what are you doing? He was only supposed to get 39 lashes minus 30 cents. Why have you spent all night bruising him and beating him? That's because Jesus understood that the stewardship assignment, the stewardship responsibility required him to bear our sins and every time we sin there's a bruise against us every time we sin there's a cut against us every time as we sin there's a broken bone in us every time we sin we fall short of the glory Isaiah says it right all our righteousness is but filthy rags all of us have been like sheep and gone astray so his stewardship assignment was to make sure that we can return here that we can come back that we can serve him that we can be who he calls us so he took it and endured it all night long, but come to find out that wasn't it, that there was still more, that God was taking him and took him right to Calvary, where he had him hung high and stretched wide, where God, they pierce your hands, where God, they pierce your feet, where God, they pierce your side, where God, they put a, a sponge with bitter wine and vinegar on it and made you drink, where God, you stayed up there every single moment, every single hour. And God, when they walk by you, they ridicule you, saying that you were able to save others, save yourself. You were able to raise others from the dead, raise yourself off of that, uh, that cross.
cross. Come down. Let us see who you really are. But they didn't understand that the stewardship obligation wasn't for Jesus to perform a miracle on the cross. The stewardship obligation was to die for us, was to take our sins and have them buried in the ground. And when, even when Jesus gave up his last breath, they thought they had won. They thought they had stopped him. They thought they had killed him. They thought that they had ended his stewardship uh, 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 exercising. But what we learned is that early on Sunday morning, early at that moment when all the other men were asleep, uh, this one woman named Mary Magdalene was working her way to a moral grave. And when she got there, she realized and saw that he was not there. And the angel proclaimed that he who was here is not there. Jesus of Nazareth has been raised. And right now he sits on the right side of God's throne, making intercession for each, intercession for each of us, which means that he is still fulfilling his stewardship assignment. That when we come to God and we say, God, this thing is too hard. He's right there saying, God, I got them. I'm going to help them. But God, we say this road is too rough. God, Jesus said, don't worry. I'll give you new shoes and new strength to handle it. <laughs> when we come to God and we say, God, this thing is taking longer than we expected it to. God said, that's all right. I'll walk with you. I'll talk with you. And I tell you that you are our own. That when we are coming to God with our, with our efforts, God says, I'm proud of it and I accept it because guess what? I gave you little and you gave me much. I gave you just life and you gave me more life. That I restored your life. That you helped someone else have their life restored. That I gave you favor. That you showed someone favor. That I anointed you and you shared your anointing with someone else. That God God sees our results and God is going to say to us one day, good, well done, my good and faithful servant. You who have been faithful over a little, come into your father's heaven and to receive much. Let's celebrate. Someone ought to be saying amen right now. Someone ought to be praising God right now because guess what? The day is coming when you want God to make that statement. All you have to do is keep serving him. All you have to do is keep trusting him. All you have to do is keep being the steward that he's called you to be. Amen. It's easier than we realize. Just do it. Just serve. Just be who God has called you to be. And again, he gonna bless it. He gonna bless it. Come on, First Fellowship, y'all. He gonna bless it. Everything we try, he gonna bless it. Because everything we're doing, we're doing it unto him. And we're doing it for him. Amen. Let's do this. Let's have our invitations. Amen. Amen. Let me not.